Good morning, brothers and sisters. Present Sabbath to you, and I want to welcome you to the house of the Lord today. The Bible says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And we are extremely happy today to be in the house of the Lord. I want to inform you that today is prayer and fast. And last, um, last quarter, no, last month, sorry, we studied repentance. Because most of us can remember we studied Ezekiel 8 and 9, and that was repentance. And today we are studying the oneness, oneness in Christ. So um, may God bless us as we prepare ourselves to study God's word and to be obedient to it. Because the same says, trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus. You must trust and obey the choristers. Good morning and happy Sabbath to all. We begin our song service with hymn 319, Lord, I want to be a Christian, hymn 319. Oh, oh, oh. 
and marvelous ways. God for his grace. As we go into our lesson review this morning, I want you to take your Bible in hand because there may be times that you would want to check on it. Take your quarterly also in the other hand. There may be times you want to follow and see what I'm saying, but whichever way it goes, keep God in your heart and he will answer the questions to you because this morning there are quite a few questions that we will be attempting to address or we'd raise or even possibly try to answer. Let's bow our heads. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, for your word that you have made to us so plain and so clear. Give us a greater understanding into these things, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. Now, let me start by saying that you need faith to go through this lesson study today. Because all the records that man have available to him occur after the flood. And what we're talking about this morning, everything occurred before the flood. And even a great bit of it happened before man. It has to do with the plan of God's redemption. And so as we look at the lesson study this week, the promise, God's everlasting covenant, the big question is, what happened? Now if you're Trinidadian like me, you're going to say, what happened? You can't really understand this thing. It's a maze. We're wondering what is really going on here. But what happened? And let's look now if we can get some of these answers. Now it speaks, it takes us from the sixth day of creation, and it's the divine pronouncement that everything was very good. That is because that day the Lord created human beings in his own image, something God had never done according to the Genesis account prior to this. Here is God himself, as it were, to use human terms, entering new territory, create in his image and likeness, according to the Genesis account. We can't go further than that. We cannot come any way further than that going behind us. Let's look back and see what it's going to happen here. God did this, and he made man in his image. So this week's lesson, we look at what God had first made. What happened to it in this perfect creation setting? And finally, it touches on the quarter's theme, what is God going to do about that which has gone wrong to make it right again? These are some rather interesting questions, and there are many and varied views. And as I said before, you need faith to accept because if you do not accept the answers in faith, the questions will still remain. 
only when you accept the answers given, then the questions do not become a problem. And let's see what God's word says to us. So the question is, why are we here? How did we get here? And where are we finally going? Some big questions. How did we get here? Why are we here? If you have not yet seen for your own self God's glory in your life, God's purpose in your life, but God being responsible for your existence, your question of why you're here would always remain. How did we get here? How did we get to this position within which we are faced, this position within where, where when we are, is all because of choice. And may I say to us, to get out of here also has to do with choice. And unless you accept that you have a choice to get out, the question of you being here in the condition that you are in, and I'm speaking about sin, will remain as well as the condition. The question and condition will remain. Where are we finally going? This too also requires faith. And unless and until we accept the answer of where it has been designed for us to go, we will still remain in this place. No wonder Jesus would have said to those folks who argued with him some time ago, you're still in your sins. You're born in sin and you stay there unless and until you accept what I say to you. And he said to them to get out of it. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. If you cannot accept that, you remain. It's amazing to say that the Bible of the scripture at that time said that that day, many of Jesus' disciples left him and they never followed again. Because they didn't accept the answer. Therefore, the question still remain. What is interesting about the Genesis 1-1 or this text is that the Lord does not attempt to prove that he's the creator. When we try to challenge that God did and I want proof that he did, I will remain with the question. But Genesis does not set about to establish or to prove that God is the creator. It must be accepted by faith. And so coming out of this as I hasten through the lesson study, there are many different views about how did we get here. And so the secularists would say one thing and the creationists would say another. But then again, I want to remind us that unless we accept the answers offered in the scripture, the questions would always remain. And have you ever realized that the world still questions why and how? Because they do not accept the answer. Now let's examine one question here. I'm going to try to take it in part. It says, realizing that there is a certain amount of faith required in almost anything we believe, write down reasons why it makes sense to have faith that we are here because a creator purposely puts us here, as opposed to our origins being rooted in nothing but pure chance. What are the reasons you can give to identify your reasons, your own conviction to identify, I believe I'm here not by chance, but I believe I'm here by the creator. My reasoning that I came upon was, if we were all here by chance, then how is it that all things are a product of an originator, and how is it that new species no longer appear, if it was just by chance? If it was just by chance, then what do we expect to come after us if it is all about evolution? When will it change? Cannot be understood, cannot be accepted. And that requires, as far as I'm concerned, a lot more faith to believe than the story of creation. We were all created in the image of our maker. What does it mean, the question is asked, that God created us in his own image? Have you ever asked yourself that question? What does it really mean that I was created in God's image? Because Jesus, for me, this is what it means that I was created in, 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 in God's image, a form. Jesus became like us. That won't be difficult for him to do because we were created like him. Think about it. Matthew traces Jesus', Matthew and Luke traces, traces Jesus' ancestry all the way back to God, in particular Luke. Matthew stops at Abraham, but Luke takes the ancestry of Jesus all the way back to God, created in his form. In thinking, we are in God's form because the scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
But then Isaiah points out, in our condition, even though we're created in his form, one of the differences is that our thoughts are not his thoughts. It means that we both think. Am I correct? Yeah. And our ways are not his ways. It means that we both act. So we're created in his form. When Paul was persecuting the Christians, are we created in God's image and likeness? What did Jesus say to Paul? Why are you persecuting me? And another way we can identify that we are created in God's image and likeness is because it says now, the sheep on his right hand, he said to them, in as much as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto? You have no longer any questions if you're created in God's image and likeness. If you, un if you, un if you accept these answers. Then the question is asked, what about us human beings in God's creation that is different from everything else? I can find no similarities. But one big difference that remains put, and I continue to encourage my children in this particular one, one of the big differences in creation that sets us apart from everything else is that we have the power of speech. And that's why I would always tell them, when you come to worship, don't listen to the music. Use your voice. Because everything else can make noise. And everything else can make a sound. But we can give God praise. Amen. One of the uniqueness of our creation in God's whole creation of this earth, as it, as it states. Then what else can we f be found in the whole creation story? There's a deliberate process of procreation that distinguishes human beings from animals and any other li life form. We have the deliberate process of procreation. Everything else operates on instinct and animalism. What, has also what also makes us distinct and different is that we have dominion over creation and God made Eve as a complement to Adam. I'm not going down the road with some arguments that some people are going to present. But that's what the Bible says in the book of Genesis. Eve was a complement to Adam. You will never find that in the animal kingdom. And that distinguishes us from all of God's creation. Animals, all of them are like what's made on the same day and had the same purpose and function. But he made a distinction between human beings. Is it the uniqueness, or rather it is the uniqueness of the human mind that makes possible a nourishing relationship with God? Something the rest of God's earthly creation do not have the process to so do, or they are unable to do it. Notice, too, that the unique account of how God created the woman. That's a beautiful thought that comes out from it. God created woman. He took Adam, put him to sleep, made Eve just like he made Adam. Thank God, and this is my comment, thank God he did not give man the ability to design his own woman. If we today were to follow the pattern of having to design our own woman, we would have a big mess. Because many of us would want to be domineering. Many of us would want to be lusting. Many of us would want to be commanding. And some of us would be real lazy and put them to work. But thank God he didn't do it that way. So he designed a woman he made, that God desired that man should have, rather than he designed, tell man to choose what you want. And if we would only accept the answers, the questions would all go away. Now, this lesson hastens on. In a few minutes, we've got to come to a conclusion. Notice that God, what, what the question is asked, what were the first words that God spake to man according to the story of creation? God, in his speaking, said some things very specific. He said, procreate. It may seem as though we want to be uh, selecting and pull out some things from the lesson, but no, let's see what God says. In the bottom line, he says, procreate. Then he says, populate the earth. And he says, have dominion over everything. Replenish everything, subdue everything, and have mastery over it. And he says, eat plants. That's what God said. Again, if we accept the answers, all questions would go away. It's when we tend to contend with the questions 
and reject the answers, we have problems. And we come into that very quickly. In short, according to the Bible, God's first word to man were, and let, let me just back up a little bit and say, that when God said this to Adam, Eve was at, his, was at his side. So she was not in the equation to be dominated or to be subdued. They were to both together do it. And if they accept the answer, the questions will go away. In short, according to the Bible, God's first word to man and to woman were to deal specifically with their interpretation and relationship with the physical world. Now let's run through some of these things here quickly again. Notice that in the creation process, and I want us if you never considered it before, never heard it before, that everything that came first was to serve that which came after. Are you with me? So what came on the second day had command over the first day's creation. Or what was on the first day had to serve what came on the second day. Except in two instances. And the two instances are, woman was created after man, she does not have dominion over the man. If we accept the answers, the questions would go away. And after man was created came the Sabbath. And Jesus said, the Sabbath doesn't have rulership over the man. The Sabbath was not made for man, but man for the Sabbath. So the Sabbath doesn't have rulership over you, nor me. We have authority over the Sabbath, therefore we have a choice. So the only instance where that process in creation story does not follow is in the creation of woman and the Sabbath. Where God says, I have given man the responsibility. I'm not speaking generic man. I'm speaking man across the board. All right? Now, the problem is, when we begin to question these things, that's where, they, that's where it came. And Eve now, the big question was, are the serpent asked Eve at the tree some questions? What was Eve's problem? Let me see if I can summarize it here. Uh, where's my answer? The first step into problems with Eve, as we close in 30 seconds, she completed... She contemplated the situation, she questioned the rules, she analyzed a different outcome, and the fourth step is she attempted to try, it, to try it. Whenever we question the answers that God has given, we would always have a problem with the questions that are there. Accept God's word, believe God's word, and everything will be right for you at all times. May God bless you as you continue to study his word. Thank you very much, Elder, for that, that beautiful lesson study. And we have something to go home with. Um, we are going to st start prayer and fast. And um, as I told you before that last prayer and fast, we, we studied repentance. And this, um, today, we will study oneness, oneness in Christ. Because the Bible says in um, 17 of, um, John 17 verse 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that, may, that they may be one, even as we are one. And this is Christ's expectation that, you know, we all become one. So this is the the theme and uh, the subject which we are concentrating on today. Um, we have four present presenters, and at the end of each presentation, the elder may ask, are we ready to be one? And the, quest the answer should be from the congregation, yes, we are. Are we ready to be one? The, the answer should be, um, Yes, we are. Now, the first presenter this morning would be Elder Walk. He'll be taking us through for the next three minutes or so on um, the oneness of God. O Israel, my God is one God. And he'll be, be, he'll be um, taking you through that. Elder Walk. Good morning. 
Praise the Lord. Let's put your fingers in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, and uh, we'll be reading verse 4. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that your spirit may open the word to us at this time, in Jesus' name, amen. Is it found? And uh, shall we read? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, one Lord. It is not only the Christian who reads and recites this text. If you ever got close to the Hebrew community, the Jews, you will find that this is incorporated in their prayer three times a day, every day. In the original language, Shema Yisrael El Adonai Elohinu Adonai Ikhad. Just the same thing as in the English, let's take it apart. Shema. Shema means hear, in the sense of don't break sticks in your ears. Listen, consider, learn. Amen? All right. Israel. That is the name given to our father Jacob, who wrestled an angel. He was an overcomer with God and an overcomer with man. The last part is God, El. Israel is the overcomer. Israel. And this is how he got this name. Are you a son or a daughter of Israel? A God wrestler? Let's go on. Then you have Adonai, Lord. Of course, in the Old Testament, vowels were never used. And uh, you find the Jews, they would never even pronounce God's name. They can't. And let me ask you this question. Do you believe in God? It's a trick question, eh? A relationship with God is not only about so much what you believe, but again, go back to hearing, listening, how you love, how you listen, the growth of a relationship. All right. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Ekhad. Of course, there are experiences of seeing God in an angelic form. There are experiences of seeing God in a human form. There is the understanding of the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters. One has one's own experience, and you're telling it, and you're saying, something tell me. And one who is better informed of scriptures will say, not something, someone. God spoke to you. Amen? And take a breath. That which sustains you, God. The experiences you have of mother, father. The experiences you have of being saved in a situation, God. So when the creator of all you in the universe says, Shema, hear. You know, as we say, when Jesus was asked, teach us how to pray. And he said, our father. And as he starts like that, we refer to that prayer as our Father. Among God's faithful, the Hebrews, they refer to this text in Deuteronomy 6.4, which they repeat three times a day and even sing. Go on the internet and hear it. Beautiful. Shema. The prayer is referred to as the Shema. And that's the most important part that I want you to remember today. We must listen. We must hear. Don't break sticks in your ears. All these experiences we have, if we are wrestling to know God, we are God wrestlers, they are one. Ikhat. I would like us to sing the first stanza of uh, hymn number seven. It has a name. Hymn number seven says, The Lord in Zion reigneth. Let all the world rejoice. You don't need umbrellas for this hymn.
it, just that first stanza. And uh, what is our repeat? Hmm? Are we one in red? Mm -hmm. Are we one in Christ? Yes, we are. With our head bowed and eyes closed. Loving Father, we thank you that you have invited us to call you our Father, Abba. That your spirit within us would cause us with one voice, with one experience, to reach after you. Even as our father Jacob, who said, in the time of Jacob's trouble, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so we come to you today, dear Lord, with that one desire that you bless us all indeed. And you will not bless one and not the other. And we can wait one on the other because truly you are our Father. Help us to establish this that the world may see that we are Christian by our love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, saints of God. I declare to you that we serve one true and living God. Heavenly Father, as we are about to go through your scripture, we ask for your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and give us understanding. These now mercies we ask in the blessed name. Amen. Amen. First Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, brethren, the devil would have us believe. Otherwise, you see, the devil, he doesn't particularly need us, need the world to acknowledge him or to worship him. What the devil wants is to draw man away from God. That's his great deceit and his great counterfeit. You see, it serves his purpose equally if he can have us believe that there is one more, there is more than one exalted being. James 2.9 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devil also believes and trembles. You see, the devil knows that there is one God. So his intent is to draw us away from that one God, from our true God. So the devil knows that there is one true God. So his focus is not just to draw people away from God, but it's also to discredit God. He can accomplish this just as much by convincing the world that who or what they serve is a God. Psalm 41.1 tells us, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that do it good. The majority of the world wants to believe in something or someone. We all have that within us. We all be, want to believe that, you know, we want to believe in something true, in a, a divine being. They want to worship something. They want to, the, the devil wants the world to think that if they saw God, that if they saw him, they would see God. What would the world think if they were asked to bow down and worship the devil, that great deceiver, Lucifer, the fallen angel? Most of us would shy away from the thought of worshiping the devil. The world would shy away from the thought of worshiping the devil. The devil knows that most of the world will revolt at the thought of serving him. We visualize the devil as this fallen being with horns and a forked tail as a creature out of a nightmare. But the devil's great counterfeit is fooling the world that when we bow down and worship other deities, that we are worshiping God. There are many versions of deities that peop people worship. Some worship the sun, some worship the moon, people worship Buddha and a host of other fictional beings. There is even something called polytheism, which is the worship of or belief in multiple deities, which are usually assembled into a pantheon of gods and goddesses along with their own religions and rituals. In most religions which accept polytheism, 
The different gods and goddesses are representation of forces of nature or ancestral principles. But what separates the God of heaven from all these fictional and um, powerless gods? Which of these gods that, that the people of their worship can create? Which of these gods can perform miracles? Which of these gods can feed the, feed the hungry and heal the sick? We serve a God that can do all these things, brethren. Even so, how can the created be greater than the creator, which called the created into existence? Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus say the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. Even the great King Nebuchadnezzar, after tossing Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego into the fiery furnace and witnessing these three young men unharmed and a fort in the fire, he declared the fort is like the form of the Son of God. Daniel 3.28, Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servant. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their God. I declare to you, brethren, there is one true God. He is the God of David, Abraham, and Moses. He is the God of the mountain, and he is the God of the valley. He is the God in the good time, and he is God in the bad times. Let him be your God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We will now sing the first stanza of hymn 348. The church has one foundation. Are we ready to be one with God? Yes. Amen. Let's bow. Almighty God, we, your servants, come before you on this Sabbath morning. We come before you with, with your Holy Spirit, dear Father God, asking for your spirit to fill our hearts, dear God. We ask, dear Father God, as we proceed through this program, dear God, that you bless us in all that we do, dear God. We pray, dear God, that you fill us, your people, with compassion each for one another, dear God. We pray, dear God, that we, your people, will be able to reach out to the community, reach out to each other, dear God, and extend your grace and your mercy, dear Father God, that we'll be able, that in so doing, we'll be able to draw others closer to your foe, dear Father God. We pray as this program progresses and as we continue throughout this prayer and fast Sabbath, dear God, that our hearts be filled with your love. These are our mercies we ask in the blessed name. Amen. Amen. Pleasant Sabbath, saint of God. <clears throat> Let's bow our heads. O oh, kind and loving Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for this thy holy Sabbath day. As we are about to share your word with your people, we pray to God that your Holy Spirit will move upon us and help us that we will be able to read and understand your word. Bless us, we pray and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My text this morning is taken from Ephesians 4.4. 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. The manifestation of God in Jesus disclosed the Father and the Son as one, yet distinct at the same time. So brethren, when we look at there, we notice the manifestation in God and the Son, Jesus but yet still they are together, but they are distinct. 
and so are us, so of us today. I want to read, not much time, so we won't go into much explanation, in Revelation 14, 12. It mentioned, here is the patient of the saint. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. I think we all here are. We keep the, um, the commandments of God and we have the faith of Jesus. But are we lacking in anything? Brethren, God wants to be complete in our life. And I think at times, in order to achieve the blessing that God has in store for us, we sometimes lack in certain things. I would like to just give you a share with you. And they said in, in Acts 1 14. They all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Perhaps the greatest strength of the early Christian was to unite, was, was the united to which they devoted themselves. They ate together, lived together, prayed together. They were in one accord. To reach that accord, is to enter into agreement with another party. The early church agreed together. They were bound together by the experience they had gone through. It is because of their accord that they were able to experience the Holy Spirit. Everyone was in the same mind. So many times in our church today, we wonder why we don't see the sign of the Holy Spirit where there is the move of the Holy Spirit in our life, perhaps it's because we no longer know how to be in one accord. And brethren, if we do not get in one accord, we truly will lack the Holy Spirit and we would not be able to have received the blessing that God has in store for us. We spend our week running to and fro. We lie down enough on a Sabbath morning. We sleep long. And times we get up, we come to church to sing a few songs on the Sabbath morning and to listen to a few inspiring words from the pastor. But well, we, we all don't agree on the same thing. We don't all as seek after the move of God. We are not in one accord. We must come to a place of agreement with, with our fellow Christian if we ever hope to see the miracle the early church experienced. Yeah. So brethren, if we have to experience God's Holy Spirit, uh, we must be in one accord. Coming here on the Sabbath day, yes, that is one. Right? Reading the Bible, that is one. But we must be in accord with the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, we will see miracle in, in our life. The song that we like us to sing, there's the first stanza, standards is song 500, 506. And then after all prayer, Amen. Are we ready to be one in Christ? 
Okay, we will just have one minute of prayer, please, together. We'll, you all will pray silently, and then I will close. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that I may be unified with others believers. Help me to agree with them in mind and heart and to reach an accord by which your Holy Spirit will come upon us. I ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. and amen. We will have an announcement at this time. and worship together. The Women's Ministry Department of the Church will also host a virtual prayer band via the Zoom platform immediately after the Friday night worship service on the following nights, April 2nd, 16th, and 30th, May 14th and 28th, June 11th and 25th. All women of our church are invited to join in as they worship and pray together. The Prayer Ministry Department of the South Caribbean Conference continues the 40 days of prayer experience by hosting monthly Hour of Power Prayer Encounters themed Response 714 for the remaining nine months of 2021. All are invited to log in to the Zoom platform from 4.30 to 5.30 a.m. For inspirational messages on the scripture, 2 Chronicles 7.14. The first of these daily encounters was hosted on Sabbath, March 6, 2021. The next is scheduled for Sabbath, April 3, 2021 which will be hosted by the Southwest Zone of Seventh-day Adventists, with the devotional message being presented by Pastor Damian Lewis on the topic, My People. Further program details and login information are provided on a wonderful slide for all who need to use. Further details on the dates and the zones aside and all associated with these wonderful experiences would be placed on the notice board for all. Our AY Society presents consistent Christian living. No time to be idle. This afternoon, Saturday 3rd, April 2021, at 4 to 6 p.m via our San Juan SDA YouTube channel. The participants can log in via our Zoom platform using credentials presented on the flyer. 
our special guest speaker would be none other than our friend, Pastor Miguel Benny, current youth director of East Caribbean Conference. Let's make time for this special program. The clock is ticking. Appreciation on behalf of the Bailey family is being expressed to the church members and all family and friends of their heartfelt appreciation for the outpouring of love shown in support of the venture for their sister yesterday. Thank you, everyone. Gently reminding you of reserved seating, the last two pews are reserved for parents with babies and young children. The pew directly in front of those two pews reserved for babies and parents is priority seating for the sick or differently abled. Let's continue to keep our place of worship in good order as we maintain a clean scene. Please remove all belongings as you leave the sanctuary. All unwanted wrappers and paper should accompany your person when you depart. Thought for the week. My child, you worry too much. I've got this. Remember, love God. Let's cast all our cares on him. Have a pleasant week, everyone. Welcome to the San Juan Seventh-day Adventist Church. Your presence and your health are important to us. Please pay attention to the following housekeeping announcement. Wearing of masks is mandatory. If for some reason you feel uncomfortable, please step outside for a breath of fresh air or alert someone if you need assistance. Remember to wash your hands regularly. There are wash stations to the front and rear of the compound. There are also hand sanitizing stations installed around the church. Please utilize them. They are there for your safety. You are reminded to sit three to bent to maintain the physical distancing protocol. Family members, however, can sit together. If you need to sneeze or cough, do so into the crook of your elbow. Our washrooms are located to the rear of the compound, up the corridor on the right and up the staircase. There are signs to indicate same. There is also a ladies' washroom located along the exterior corridor to the left and a washroom for the differently able to the extreme back of the compound. Differently abled individuals can ask for assistance. Upon departure, when necessary, please wait to be ushered out by deacons. They are dressed smartly in black trousers and white shirt jacks. Please follow their instructions. In the event of an emergency, the deacons along with our safety officers will facilitate the evacuation of the sanctuary. All are asked to follow their instructions. Do have a blessed day and remember brethren, there is safety in Jesus. Pleasant Sabbath, brethren. At this time, we like to call the deacons, take up their respective position. Shall we bow reverently as we seek the Lord in prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We are indeed grateful for the privilege of giving. We are grateful for your blessings over us throughout the week. And as we give to you for the furtherance of your work and your gospel, may our offerings be blessed. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers in Jesus' name.
as we begin the fourth session of this prayer and fast, deal with oneness, just like the congrega congregation to join with me as we stand reverently. We're going to take our hymnals and look at the hymn number 260. We're going to sing the first standard. And at the end of the presentation, we will do the last standard. Hover over me, Holy Spirit. morning and pleasant Sabbath once again. And it's always a privilege to be in God's house. It's always a privilege to be sanctified by the Sabbath. And do you know that the Sabbath sanctifies you? Right, that's true. So at this time, we, our focus will be on the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll be focusing on verse 6, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. And it reads, One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Unity in the Trinity. Unity in the Trinity. Talking about unity, and we have heard a lot this morning already. One God and Father of all. Father of all. God of all, meaning that he is creator. According to John 1, verse 3, says, All things were made by him, and without him, nothing that was made that was made. So God is creator, one God, and father of all. And then, above all, what it means to be above all, we are talking about the kingship, the leadership, the authority of God. God and Father above all. And if we look at Acts chapter 7 and verse 49, spoke about God, says that his heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. Talk about his God above all. And through all, what it means, God and Father through all, we're talking about the will of men, the Holy Spirit, the conqueror, my strength. If we look at John chapter 14 and verse 26, it talks about the comforter who will lead you into all truth, through all. And what about in all? God and Father in all. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, God in us. The Son, Jesus Christ. According to Philippians verse 2 and chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, It is God which what? Worketh in you to do of his good pleasures, to will and to do of his good pleasures. Philippians 2 5, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. So we're talking about unity, unity in strength, unity in God, one God and Father of all. One God and Father, the Creator, the owner of us all. We are one blood. One Creator. In our diversities of gifts, talents, abilities, we are of one blood. We report to one God. You know, a, a lot of other people talk about uh, or everybody serving, uh, praying to the same God. That's not true. It cannot. 
They are not all praying to the same God. And if you look back, some are praying to Baal and in different ways. Some just stick to the first part of, of the text stating that there is only one God. And according to Matthew 15, 9, and Mark 7, 7, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandment of men. So they cannot be praying to the same God that I know of. Don't take that for granted. Don't take that for granted. Unity, oneness, only, only through the unity of the Trinity can we achieve unity in the church. I'll go back a bit. When we talk about one God of all, the creator, we're talking about God the Father, one God and Father. And then we talk about through all. And in all, we talk about the Holy Spirit. This is the Trinity. The message of the Trinity is established in this very text. And then it says later on, in all, we're talking about Jesus, God with us, working to will and to do of his good pleasures. So this identifies the Trinity. There is unity in the Trinity. Now, if, if we do not accept, as Brother Brown mentioned earlier, we have to accept the answer by faith, and then the questions will go away. So accepting Trinity, accepting, sorry, the unity in the Godhead, as the Bible says, great is the mystery of, the God, of godliness. When we accept that by faith, then we can unite as a body, because we are all one body. Now, if you want to experience unity, let's compare unity in the church. Let, 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 let's see where we are going here. If you want to experience unity, go to the graveyard, and you will see perfect unity. No one is interfering with no one. You ever notice that? It's the most supposed to be the most comfortable place in the world. It's the safest place in the world. What the police force and the army and the government cannot achieve in the cemetery, it's there. Peace. You understand what I'm saying? Everybody in the graveyard is following the same law. You didn't understand that, right? Let me say it again. In the cemetery, all the dead are obeying the same law. Everybody lies down. Nobody gets up until the creator calls. Nobody moves. Dead to the world. Let's bring this to the church now. Unity in the church, all of us have to die to the world. The reason why we are against one another, because our eyes are open to see differences. We see different race. We see different color. We see different level of abilities. We see different level of education. There is no doctor or teacher in the graveyard. No prime minister. Everyone is dead. Unity. As Paul said, we have to die daily or else we could never achieve that level of unity. On the day of Pentecost, after these gentlemen, after these people, the disciples, the apostles, they have, they, were, they have been with Jesus for years. They thought they had unity. But on that day when they came together in one accord, dead to the world, then unity was able to be established. So brethren, for us to achieve that level of unity, we must die daily. We cannot come here. We cannot be in this world. We cannot exist under a trinity that of unity and still own something. We don't own anything. He's God of all. It's only when we start putting our names on things, then differences start coming up. 
Yeah? So that you know why some people cannot join the Seventh-day Adventist church in high status? Because you have to give it up. You can't come here and be recognized based on that. That was given to you by the world. This is not a place where we discuss who have this and who don't have this. This is where unity is supposed to exist. So for us to achieve such, we have to give up all that. So brethren, as Ellen White says, as I close, for us to understand or for us to overcome, we're talking about there are three, there are three mysteries, major mysteries that the Bible identifies. One, the mystery of the Trinity. Great is the mystery of the Godhead. First Timothy uh, 3, 9. The mystery of the incarnation. That's in, uh, caught up in First Timothy 3, 9. So the mystery of the incarnation, the mystery of the Trinity, and also the mystery of iniquity. And she says, in order for us to overcome the mystery of iniquity, which we battle against, in order for us to overcome sin, we have to accept, again, as Brother Bong says, we have to accept by faith the mystery of the Trinity and the mystery of the Incarnation. That's the only way we can overcome the mystery of, of iniquity, which is separating us from one another, which is causing disunity when we are fighting to achieve unity. So may God bless us richly. May God cause his grace and his face and his light to shine upon us so that it gives us peace, we can be in one accord. Do not wait until we have to go to the cemetery to be in one accord. We have to die daily so that the Spirit of God will hover over us and bring us that blessing so that we can only see Christ and him lifted up. May God bless us richly. So we will continue as we close. We will continue with the last verse of the hymn, Cleanse and Comfort, Bless and Save Me. as we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in our lives this morning as it is done in heaven. Lord, we beg your mercies. We petition unity among us, O Father, but we know what we have to do. We have to let go and allow you to take control of our lives. So as we commit our hearts to you this morning, may you fill us with your Holy Spirit as your Holy Spirit hoover over us. Touch each and every one of us, we pray. Have mercy upon us. We thank you. And we bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you very much, Elder. I, we are with Pastor. Um, in the meanwhile, um, I have two transfers to be read this evening, this morning, so um, the church clerk could come by and um, announce that while pastor do the transfer.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today's reading uh, is the transfer of membership. All right, this is the first reading for two requests for transfer of church memberships. Brother Keston Paddy from the San Juan SDA Church to join the Mongro SDA Church. Sister Salian John from the San Juan SDA Church to join the Mongdo SDA Church. This is the first reading. After the second reading, we will be asked to vote too so that this transfer can take place. We also have a second reading of an outgoing request of transfer after which you will be asked to vote. This second reading for Sister Jade Peterson from the San Juan SDA Church to join the Pinto Road SDA Church. I will now have our vote. So the vote on Happy Sabbath, everybody. The vote on the floor is that we transfer the membership of Sister Jade Peterson from the San Juan Seventh Adventist Church to the Pinto Road Seventh Adventist Church. All in favor? Those opposed by the same sign? There's no one. So that means that the church is okay with the transfer of membership of Sister Jade Peterson to the Pinto Road Seventh Adventist Church from our church. So the church clerk department will take care of that and when that is complete and we receive word from Pinto that they have received and accepted her, she will no longer be considered a member of our church, our local congregation. She remains a seven Adventist. All right, thank you very much, Abby. Good morning again, everyone. Nice seeing you, Sister Goodrich, Kendall. Sister Charles, how are you doing? Happy Sabbath. All right, so we are, we are celebrating uh, prayer and fast, the very first Sabbath of each month. We have that. Dr. and Sister Griffith, happy Sabbath. And happy Sabbath to everyone. And um, I just came from the... Uh, Hosanna Church, I'm beginning to forget where I was, which is not a good thing. <laughs> I just came from the Hosanna Church where we had a wonderful service. Um, and I suppose that in, in our church here, there have been several presentations before this one that dealt with different aspects of Christian living. I have entitled my uh, presentation, Born Again and Living Meaningful Lives. And the... And the, what I love to call the springboard text is 1 Peter 1, 23. Am I doing this right? I don't know, guys. The, um, the clicker doesn't seem to be working. Am I doing something wrong? Oh, there you go. Did you change it or did I change it? Okay, great. So, um, yes, First Peter 1, 23. Um, I suppose you've seen it a lot better up there. Let's pray before we get into this. Father God, we are thankful to you that you have not only died for us, but that we can live with the reality of your resurrection. And because you were raised again, you ascended into heaven, and because that happened, you're there pleading for our sins. And Lord, your promise doesn't end there. Because you promise that you will return again to save us into our eternal home. And so as we spend the next few moments on your word, we ask you to enlighten our minds and touch our hearts so that we will be renewed with an understanding of your love and your grace in Jesus' name. 
Amen. First Peter 1 verse 23 said, For you have, sorry, what? No, 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 I'm not seeing. For, let's read it together. I am not seeing for some reason or the other. <laughs> let's read this together. All right, so that is the NIV. Let's read the ESV, the English Standard Version. All right, let's do the King James now. Oh, I can read it this way. Be <laughs> for me. Being born again. Let's read together. Being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And this is the one that I like, because it's the, it, it's the New Living Translation. It's a little bit more contemporary, speaks a little bit more our language. So let's read this one. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever, because it comes from the eternal living word of God. I love that. I don't know about you, but that one tells me clearly that even if I die, I yet will not die as long as I trust in God. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thought. And so what does 1 Peter 1 verse 23 mean? And, and in order to get the meaning, and we've been doing this um, in our Sabbath afternoon Bible study, we've been talking about pericope which basically is that larger passage that clears up the, the smaller passages. So 1 Peter 1 verse 23 means it describes how Christians, those who God has caused to be born again, should live now. That's what 1 Peter 1 verse 23 is telling you. It, it's saying to you and I, how we should live. And it also encourages Christians to mentally engage in setting their hopes on God's future grace for us. That's a long one, but that's what it says. He is encouraging those who are in trouble, because they were in trouble back then. I need some water, please. Water. Uh, the, the, he's, he's, let's go back to the other one, please. The, the one before, please. Yes, he encourages Christians, those who were in trouble then, to mentally move beyond their problems. They tell me that prisoners of war, the ones who survive, are those who can zoom out of their current circumstances, the situation within which they find themselves, the problems of, their, of, of, of the hardship of being in a prison of war camp, and find themselves in a place that is more acceptable. Peter is saying the same thing. He encourages Christians who may be going through difficult situations to mentally engage in setting their hopes. Thank you very much. I can see it much clearer now. In setting their hopes in God's future grace for us. So in other words, he's saying our life afflictions are just for the moment. He's saying that the problem that we are experiencing now will not last forever and that there is something better over and beyond today's problems. And that's a good thing to think of while you're going through troubles. Next one, please. I must be doing something wrong. Yes, let, okay. Uh, no, that's, no, go, go forward. <laughs> go forward, two slides. Yes. And uh, it emphasizes that Christians must choose to act as those who are God's own people. And this is important, to act and behave as if the moral It emphasizes that Christians must choose to act as those who are God's own people. In other words, you recognize who you are. And you realize that you are important and that you are valuable and that you have different reasons for, for existence that you... Okay. 
your family are living on, and that that your values are different, that your morals are different, that you walk to the beat of a different drum, and then you reject the evil motivation and desires that determine your actions before your baptism or before your coming to Christ. What does that mean? It means that that which motivated you in the past to do the things that you did can no longer be the motivators for the future and the present. In other words, if your actions were motivated by greed, that can no longer be your motivator. If your actions were motivated by pride, that can no longer be a motivator. If your actions were motivated by anything other than lifting up Christ, those, are, those motivators are supposed to be rejected. And then our, cho our choices matter. Why? Because God has placed a high value on our lives, and that was the cost of the blood of Jesus Christ. And this is a perfect time and place to make this statement. Because over this weekend, we celebrated the crucifixion of Jesus. And we can visibly take our minds and our thoughts back to that Friday afternoon. When the sinless Son of God, remember the sermon last night, when the sinless Son of God, without reason, was crucified so that the sinful sinner that you and I are could be saved. And because of that, we are valuable. And we should reflect our values. One of the reasons why the royal family is not very pleased with Prince Harry and his wife is because in their op opinion, they are not reflecting the blue-bloodedness of the royal family. They have become common. They have become plebs. They are not fit to be called prince and princess and, and count and countess. They are just normal. They are becoming American. And there's nothing worse for a British royal person to be called an American. And there's nothing worse for a Christian who knows God to behave as if he doesn't recognize his or her value. Uh, since God has made us able, we now must strive to earnestly give love to each other. See, there's always a reaction to God's action. God does not save us just to be saved, but to be part of his eternal salvation plan. That is important. You don't just get saved and then sit down and say, hey, I'm, a, I'm there, I'm done, I reach. We never reach until everyone reach. Um, not too long ago, uh, we, I, I had a service here for the social workers, and their theme was Ubuntu. I am because we are. I am, I have achieved, I have not achieved until everyone else would have achieved. I am not, I have not done all that I am capable of doing until everyone who God has placed in my path has had the opportunity to decide for him. Next slide, please. Right, so we're going to spread it out now to, to the larger pericope. For you know that it was not with perishable, this is First Peter 1, verse 18 to 25. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty ways of life, handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Next slide. Now that you have been purified, Peter, 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 Peter is not a great linguist as Paul is, but he does write great. Now that you have been purified, now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. The text that we're looking at. For all people are like grass. He's saying, that's how important you are. 
but your current reality is for all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. But Peter graphically said, listen to people, you're nothing. Without God, you're nothing. And that is so graphically displayed ever so often in our lives. Ever sometimes we wake up in the morning and we hear, this one just died. Or that one just died. And ever so often you say, but how he could dead? I saw him yesterday almost as if because you saw him yesterday, he can't be dead today. I saw him just yesterday and he was in the peak of health. But he's grass. And sister, sister, sister Griffith, you plant a lot, so you know sometimes you wake up in the morning and there's a beautiful flower on the tree, and by the time the day is over, it's just waited and are faded and withered, and by the next day, it's on the ground and it's manure. And that's what our lives are without Christ. But it says, but it says, now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. And you know, sometimes loving somebody means telling them no. You see, Jesus and my wife and I, as we were driving uh, from, from Hosanna to here, uh, we were talking, he said, no, Jesus is not always gentle Jesus, right? Sometimes he has to tell people no in love. He has to do that, but make sure when you say no, it is out of love and it is meant to save that person. Next slide, please. Um, what about 1 Peter? This is a very nice book, and if you get a chance, read it. 1 Peter was written about 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. The Christian church was facing major persecution for their faith, just as we are right now. It may not be right here, but our ideals, our morals are being challenged daily. When you can sit in a country that calls itself a Christian country and that same country is celebrating Homosexual Day, when you can sit in a country where they say we need to legalize marijuana, when we sit in, in a Christian country when it's okay to do so many unchristian things, and the sad thing is we still expect to get the blessings of God because God is a tree. Peter's letter, letter is a manual of how we sh they should respond to life in difficult times. So read it. In COVID time, in times when you don't have enough money, in times of uncertainty, read First Peter. It is relevant to you, the individual Christian, how you should respond to suffering now. And there's so many people who have either suffering within their own selves or within their families or within their friendship network. Brother Bailey, for example. Hi, Brother Bailey. Their, their family is dealing with issues. And we need to pray, and we also need to know how to deal with those kinds of situations without losing faith. And that is the goal of First Peter, telling you and I how we can go through difficult times. Next slide, please. How we can go through difficult times, face the temptation, face the challenges, and still not lose faith. And so Peter urges us to put all their hope, put all our hope in the perfect future which Christ has. We got to transcend the problems of the now. We got to move beyond all the uncertainties because if you fix yourself on the uncertainties of today, you have no answer to keep you quiet. You have no answer to keep you hopeful. You got to learn to obey and trust God in the present even in your suffering. And that's one of the most difficult things to do. How do I trust God when he told me he's going to keep me and I'm sick? One of the things that I still can't understand almost 13 years after my mom died is how a vegetarian woman... <laughs> Brother Billy, I see you shaking your head. How a vegetarian woman who never used her microwave, didn't even allow us without quarreling to use it when we came in her house, ate as much raw food as possible, lived in church practically. I love to tell the story that I think the best thing we did to her mom is allow her to remain for her funeral. There, there were two days of funeral for her in New York. We allowed her to overnight in the church. 
because my mom practically lived in church. How could someone like that still suffer for two years and die of cervical cancer? <laughs> I mean, where was God? What was he doing? Did he see Selena Mentor in pain? I remember one day she had this, so Dr. Griffith, you probably know in the days, a patch, I, I think it's a morphine patch that, that, that helped with pain. She had it, but it was used up. And my mom was all okay. And when that thing expired, I think it was, you call it or whatever it is, then you saw real pain. I mean, why? How do you still keep the faith when things like that is happening? And First Peter is telling us that we can obey and trust God in the present, even in the midst of suffering. One of the best memory I have of my mom, and I must have told you this story a thousand times, is the last Sunday on Mother's Day we were all around our better children. And our pastor walked in, and it made me kind of jealous because she stood up straight and fluffed her pillow. And uh, he asked her, he said, Selena Mentor, are you ready to die? And she looked at him with a big smile on her face and said, yes, I am. Because I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, this was a lady who knew that she was going to die. She absolutely, we all knew it. We didn't want to believe it then. But we knew. The doctors had told us. And everything pointed that way. But her life, and I'm not saying that she's better than anyone. That's the example that I have. And you probably have your own examples also. She had lived her life and had trusted her God and was willing to accept whatever his choices were for her. And that is something that buoys me up every day. And I always say, if I have to die, let me die like my mom. Enough time to confess your sin. Enough time to console others. Enough time to show an example of fortitude in the face of trial. Enough time to know that God is God. And even in pain, he will take you through. Next slide. Uh, it's beautiful and profound and challenging. Just re I, I commend this, part, this book to you. It lays the foundation for the rest of Peter's uh, letter. It teaches that in spite of whatever suffering we may face, God himself has already showed us great mercy in Christ by including us in his family. Because the Bible says, and I'm skip over to, to until you get the takeaways, please. Um, yes, thank you. Um, the Bible says that Jesus was the lamb slain from the very foundation of the world. Just imagine, before you sin, Leon, in fact, before he even existed, before we all were even in liquid form, Christ had already died for you and I. Before there was a reason to sin, Christ had already decided to die. And that can only be done by someone divine. You know, next time I can call your name. <laughs> As a human being, I have to wait until you mess up to help you. You know, if I see you walking down the road and walking strong as you usually do, I'll, I'll ask you to help me. But when you fall down, Dexter, and I see that you can get up, that's when I call Vanessa to pull you up. I will be helping by calling her, all right? I can't help you before I know that you need help, but that's not God. God can help you, Dexter, and you, Vanessa, and, and you, Marcia, and, and, and you, Sister Brown, and, 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 and everybody in church. He can provide a help in time of need before there is a need. While we're yet speaking, he will answer. His ears are not stopped up. His arms are not shortened. And so what are some of the takeaways from this passage? First, through faith in Christ, God has caused Christians to be born again to a living hope. Because Jesus is raised from the dead, our hope in Jesus is not a wish. A lot of people want to tell us, oh, you guys are pie in the sky, people. There's nothing like God. There's nothing like heaven. You know, it's unfortunate that one day that will become a reality and where would they be? Our hope is not the wish. It is as alive as Jesus is. And it's Easter, so we know that he rose again. Therefore, our inheritance as God's children is eternal, full of glory, and secured forever. 
God himself is guarding him. And the Bible says he neither sleeps nor slumbers. So he's not going to give a shut eye and somebody else will come by. He's going to always be watching. Second, even in suffering, which is all too real and causes sadness, Christians benefit. How can I benefit from suffering? First Peter tells us, our faith grows stronger and it's worth more than gold. Our faith will bring great glory when Jesus is revealed. Therefore, the Christian has every reason to rejoice even while suffering. One of my favorite preachers, Pastor C.D. Brooks, loves to say it this way. He says, the God becomes extremely real even to the unbelieving when we flatten our backs because those are the moments when the only place we can look is straight up. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when somebody hit their toe on a stone, as we often do, that's the moment when they love the ball, oh God? And when you're in deep trouble, you instinctively reach out to someone bigger than you. You're telling a child, come to daddy, come to daddy. She can barely walk and she tries to run away, but let her fall. That's when she creeps, run, roll straight back to daddy. Because that is the place of safety. In our moments of suffering, when life seems meaningless and challenging, those are the moments when the reality of God becomes very, very near and dear to us. Third, we must see ourselves as holy. That's what Peter is saying. We must see ourselves as holy and act that way or being set apart. People with a special purpose. So you can't walk anyhow. You can't live anyhow. You can't do anything. You can't say this is my body or this is how I feel because how you feel does not matter. I want that to sink in. How I feel doesn't matter. So when you come to me and say, Pastor, I feel this is right and it's obviously against what God is saying, I don't have a problem because I don't know you're wrong. My job now is by the grace of God to lead you back to the point where you start saying, thy will be done. That's what First Peter is saying. We will live in a world, but we must live as foreigners. And I, I know that. I know about living as a foreigner. It doesn't matter where you are. As long as you're not from there and you think you have the best Trini accent and somebody walks up to you and says, where are you from? It happens all the time. Happens all the time. I'm driving in the United States. I have a nice journey permit, but I'm driving a lot better. I'm driving a lot more circumspect because I don't want to hit the people car. I'm a foreigner there. I'm living in this world, and I got to let the world know that I have different values. I have to let the world know by my behavior, by my speech, by my dress, by the things I do, by the things I say, and even how I think because my thought becomes actions. I have to let everyone know that I am not from here. And I promise myself one day when somebody asks me where you're from, I will say heaven. And I won't be lying. We must mentally engage in setting all of our hopes in God's future grace for us. We spoke about that a little earlier. And fourth, our time here is brief, but our lives will go on for all eternity in Christ. And that is such a blessing. He is the word of the Lord, and the word, and the word of the Lord, Peter writes, remains forever. That's the good news that was preached to Peter's reader, and which they believed, and which has kept them, which kept them strong in difficult times. And that's the message that first Peter 1, verse 23 wants to share with you today. That there is something better than now. That you and I are important. That you and I have a place in God's salvation plan. That God has already made it possible for you and I to be saved. And that it is time that we start living with that reality. May we do that now before we leave this place. May we make that decision now before we step away from here. Because God alone knows if this would be the last call that is made on your life.
we come to a conclusion of today's service, we will now turn to hymn number 321. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. Three, two, one. stand. at that time to say, my Jesus, I love thee. We've got to begin saying it now. I'd ask you to take your seat just before the benediction, please. And we want to introduce this month, in the last few minutes we have remaining, for this quarter, starting today, this will be our quarter of compassion. A quarter of? All right. So now that you heard me, let me hear this. A quarter of? Compassion. compassion. That's right. So what we want to encourage everybody to do is, as often as you would come to God's house, come with a gift to give to somebody, exchange with somebody. Is that all right? Yes, yes it's okay. So we're going to start it off this morning or this afternoon. We, ha we have celebrating three, at least three persons here today are celebrating a birthday today. Thank God for them. At least, at least three. At least as information came to me and one of them is trying to run away from us now. Brother Bailey, don't run. Today is your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to take Romans chapter 12. Verse 10, it says, Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. What does it say to do it? One another? Prefer one another. I hope that would make it easier for me to do this morning. So you're going to help me find somebody to give my presence to. I'm going to give Brother Billy. Brother Billy, come. Please. As you celebrate your birthday today, Brother Billy, I'm going to ask you to give this to your sister, Sister Monica. <laughs> Yes, this is all the way up in the balcony, and you were a lot closer to me, so I asked you to give it to her. So, right, so it's your birthday, you prefer somebody above you. 
And I'm going to ask the congregation to help me find somebody to give this last token to today. Who would you prefer above yourself? This is hard, boy. <laughs> I need to do this quickly. We need to wrap up. <laughs> sister, the first person that responded, sister. There's a guy in the pink shirt. Any pink shirt guys here, would you please stand? Don't look around. Just look down and see a pink shirt. <laughs> Come, my brother. You have been selected today to receive this token. And so we want you, to, every Sabbath you come to church, to please bring a token for the next quarter to share with somebody. Is that all right? Are we committed? Thank you. That's Malcolm from Grenada. He is a USC student. We're glad to have you with us today. All right, so shall we now stand for the benediction? <laughs> Heavenly Father, is it, it is with grateful heart that we stand before you and we bow in your presence. Thank you that you have accepted us into your presence today because the Father is looking for true worshipers. Give us the humility to love each other so that we may glorify you so that the world may know that by this we are your disciples. All the messages we have heard today and all the prayers would have been presented before you today, may they be accepting to you and transforming to our lives. Grant us the peace that passes all understanding and keep us until you come again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Continue to have a happy Sabbath. All right, just quickly, you would have remembered <clears throat> at the beginning of the year, we, um, the nominating committee shared with you an incomplete list of individuals who would serve the church in the year 2021. And I also promised that um, as time permits, the church board will be completing the list uh, incrementally. And so we want to present you with an additional set of individuals who the church board has chosen to um, fill some additional, some position that remained open. The first person is Sister Zakia Lewis, and we, we, we recommend in that Sister Lewis serve the church in the position of head Sabbath school superintendent. We're also presenting Brother Michael Walk as an elder. We're also presenting Sister Jacqueline Burton as an assistant events coordinator. Sister Joan Gabriel as personal ministry secretary, Brother Stephen Alexis as publishing coordinator, Sister Marcia George as AY sponsor, Brother Stephen Alexis as assistant singles ministries leader, Sister Crystal Gales, Crystal Gales Stowe as a member of the AV department. I see, yes, there you are. <laughs> Sister Alyssa Kamabach as Assistant Head AY Secretary, and Sister Alicia Montano as Head of the Children's, as children's Choir Coordinator. Just want to read those names again quickly. Sister Zakia Lewis, Head Sabbath School Superintendent, Brother Michael Walk, Elder. Sister Jacqueline Burton, Assistant Events Coordinator. Sister Joan Gabriel, Assistant Personal Ministry Secretary. Brother Stefan Alexis, Publishing Coordinator. Sister Marcia George, AY Sponsor. The AY Department usually has a male and a female sponsor. Sister George is a female sponsor. Brother Stefan Alexis, Assistant Head of the Singles Ministries Department. Sister Crystal Gail Stowe, a member of the AV Department. Sister Alyssa Kamabach, is assist, Assistant Head AY Secretary, and Sister Alicia Montano is the Head Coordinator of the Children's Choir. Those recommendations are being made by the Church Board acting as the nominating committee as is provided for in the Church Manual. And these individuals have been contacted and have agreed to serve. And so we present these names before you for voting and acceptance. All in favor, will you kindly show your right hand? Those opposed by the same sign? There's no one opposed, therefore, 
um, these individuals have been accepted by the church and will start serving um, as soon as time permits them to do so. One final bit of, well, not information, one final announcement. Um, as you all would know or maybe know, the board of the San Juan Seventh-day Adventist Church Welfare Luncheon has taken a decision to temporarily close, and I want to emphasize the word temporarily. Temporarily close the operations of the luncheon, which occurred on the 31st of March, Wednesday gone. Um, we have notified the higher organization, um, both the, Carib the South Caribbean Conference Corporation and the church board of this church. However, the board has been advised that this information should be shared with the church in a business meeting setting. The board has therefore, the church board of the San Juan Seventh-day Adventist Church has therefore decided that at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday coming, instead of having our normal uh, Wednesday evening service, we will be having a business meeting to provide this information in as broad a way as possible to the church. We expect the president of the South Caribbean Conference, the executive secretary, and the treasurer of the South Caribbean Conference to also be there at that meeting. It will be on Zoom, and yes, it will be on Zoom. And so you can participate from your homes. We hope that as many of us can be um, uh, in attendance so that the issues surrounding the temporary closure can be ventilated and shared. So see you on Wednesday evening for that business meeting. Thank you very much for being in church this morning. Thank you very much for sharing in the worship service. Those of you who participated uh, in leading roles, thank you very much for ministering. Those of you who sat and sang and listened, thank you very much for being here. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. Take care. Get home safe. And please remember, don't forget the COVID guidelines. Have a happy Sabbath.